Chapter 7. At the time when I stood in the churchyard reading the family tombstones, I had just enough learning to be able to spell them out. My construction, even of their simpler meaning, was not very correct, however, for I read Wife of the Above as a complimentary reference to my father's exaltation to a better world. And if any one of my deceased relations had been referred to as below, I have no doubt I should have formed the worst opinions of that member of the family. Neither were my notions of the theological positions to which my catechism bound me at all accurate. For I have a, high, a lively remembrance that I supposed my declamation that I was to walk in the same manner all the days of my life laid upon me an obligation always to go through the village from our house in one particular direction and never to vary it by turning down by the wheelwrights or up by the mill. When I was old enough, I was to be apprenticed to Joe. But until I could assume that dignity, I was not to be what Mrs. Joe called Pompeyed, or as I render it, pampered. Therefore, I was not only the odd boy about the forge, but if any neighbour wanted an extra boy to frighten birds or pick up stones or do any such job, I was favoured with the employment. In order, however, that our superior position might not be compromised thereby, a money box was kept upon the kitchen mantel shelf into which it was publicly made known that all my earnings were dropped. I had the impression that they were to be eventually contributed towards the liquidation of the national debt, but I, I had no hope of personal participation in the treasure. Mr. Wopsle's great aunt kept an evening school in the village. That is to say, she was a ridiculous old woman of limited means and unlimited infirmity, who used to go to sleep from six to seven every evening in the society of youth who paid tuppence a week each for the improving opportunity of seeing her do it. She rented a small cottage and Mr. Wopsles had the room upstairs where we students used to overhear him reading aloud in a most dignified and terrific manner and occasionally bumping on the ceiling. There was a fiction that Mr. Wopsle examined the scholars once a quarter. What he did on these occasions was to turn up his cuffs, stick up his hair, and give us Mark Antony's oration over the body of Caesar. This was always followed by Collins' Ode on the Passions, wherein I particularly venerated Mr. Wopsle as revenge, following his, throwing his blood-stained sword in thunder down and taking the war dancing trumpet with a withering look. It was not with me then, as it was in later life, that I fell into the society of the passions. And when I did and compared them with Collins and Wopsle, it was rather to the disadvantage of both gentlemen. Mr. Wopsle's great aunt, besides keeping this educational institution, kept in the same room a little general shop. She had no idea what stock she had or what price anything in it was, but there was a little greasy memorandum book kept in a drawer, which served as a catalogue of prices, and by this oracle, Biddy arranged all the shop transaction. Biddy was Mr. Wopsle's great-aunt's granddaughter. I confess myself quite unequal to the working out of the problem as to what relation she was to Mr. Wopsle. She was an orphan like myself, like me too, she had been brought up by hand. She was most noticeable, I thought, in respect of her extremities, for her hair always wanted brushing, her hands always wanted washing, and her shoes always wanted mending and pulling up at the heel. This description must be re received with, with a weekday limitation, for on Sundays she went to church elaborated. Much of my unassisted self and 
more by the help of Biddy than of Mr. Wopsle's great aunt, I struggled through the alphabet as if it were a bramble bush, getting considerably worried and scratched by every letter. After that, I fell among those thieves, the nine figures, who seemed every evening to do something new to disguise themselves and baffle recognition. But at last I began, in a purblind, groping kind of way, to read, to write and cipher on the very smallest scale. One night I was sitting in the chimney corner with my slate, expending great efforts on the production of a letter to Joe. I think it must have been a full year after our hunt upon the marshes, for it was a long time after, and it was winter and a hard frost. With an alphabet on the hearth at my feet for reference, I contrived in an hour or two to print and smear this epistle as follows. Me dear er uh, Joe, I op you quit writ. Well, I hope I shall soon be able for to teach you, Joe, and we shall all be so good in and when I'm prentiged to you, Joe, what larks? Believe me, Pip. There was no indispensable necessity for communicating with Joe by letter inasmuch as he sat beside me and we were alone. But I delivered this written communication, slate and all, with my own hand, and Joe received it as a miracle of erudition. I say, Pip, old chap, cried Joe, opening his blue eyes wide. What a scholar you are, aren't you? I should like to be, said I, glancing at the slate as he held it, with a misgiving that the writing was rather hilly. Why, here's a Joe. Here's a J and an O, and here's a J and an O, Pip, and, and a Joe. I had never heard Joe read aloud to any greater extent than this monosyllable. And I had observed at church last Sunday, when I accidentally held our prayer book upside down, that it seemed to suit his convenience quite as well as if it was the right way up. Wishing to embrace the present occasion, and finding out whether in teaching Joe I should begin quite at the beginning, I said, ah, but read the rest, Joe. The rest, eh, Pip, said Joe, looking at me with a slowly searching eye. One, two, three, why, there's three Joes and O's and three Joes. Oh, doesn't it, Pip? I leaned over Joe and with the aid of my forefinger read aloud the whole letter. Astonishing, said Joe when I had finished. You are a scholar. How do you spell Gargery, Joe? I asked him with a modest patronage. I don't spell it at all, said Joe. But supposing you did? Oh, it can't be supposed, said Joe, though I am uncommon fond of reading too. Are you, Joe? Uncommon. Give me, said Joe, a good book or, or a good newspaper and sit me down before the fire and I ask no better. Look. He rubbed his knees a little. Knees a little. When you do come to a J and a O and says you, here at last is a J O. How interesting reading is! I derived from this last that Joe's education, like steam, was yet in its infancy. Pursuing the subject, I inquired, Didn't you ever go to school, Joe, when you were as little as me? No, Pip. Didn't you ever go to school, Joe, when you were as little as me? Well, Pip, said Joe, taking up the poker and settling himself to his usual occupation when he was thoughtful of slowly raking the fire between the lower bars. I'll tell you. 
My father, Pip, he were given to drink. And when he were overtook with a drink, he hammered away at my mother, most unmerciful. It were almost the only hammering that he did, except he hammered at me, and he hammered at me with a vigour only to be equalled by the vigour with which he didn't hammer at his anvil. You, you're a listening and understanding, Pip? Yes, Joe. Consequence, my mother and me, we ran away from my father several times, and then my mother, she'd go out to work and she'd say, Joe, she'd say, no, please God, you shall have some schooling, child. And she'd put me to school. But my father were that good in his heart that he couldn't abear to be without us. So he'd come with most tremendous crowds and he'd make such a row at the doors of the houses where we was that they used to be obliged to have no more to do with us and give us up to him. And then he took us home and hammered us. Which you see, Pip, said Joe, pausing in his meditative raking of the fire and looking at me were a drawback in my learning. Certainly, poor Joe. Though, mind you, Pip, said, uh, said Joe, with a judicial touch or two of the poker on the top bar, rendering unto all they do and maintain an equal justice twixt man and man, my father were good in his heart, don't you see? I didn't see, but I didn't say so. Well, Joe pursued, somebody must keep the pot a boiling, Pip, or oh, the pot won't boil, don't you know? I saw that and said so. Consequence, my father didn't make objections to my going out to work, so I went to work at my present calling, which were his too if he'd have followed it. And I were tolerable hard. I worked, I assure you, Pip. In time, I were able to keep him, and I kept him till he went off in a purple leptic fit. And it were my intentions to have put on his tombstone that whatsoever failings are on his part, remember, reader, he were that good in his heart. Joe recited this couplet with such manifest pride and such careful pers perspicacity that I asked him if he'd made it up himself. I made it, said Joe, my own self. I made it in a moment. It was like striking out a whole shoe complete in a single blow. I never was so much surprised in my life. Couldn't credit it in my own head. To tell you the truth, I hardly believed it were in my own head. And as I was saying, Pip, it were my intentions to have it cut over him on his tombstone. But poetry costs money. Cut it how you will, small or large, and it weren't done. Not to mention bearers and all the money that could be spared we wanted for my mother. She were poor in health and quite broke. She weren't long a following, poor soul, and her share of peace came round at last. Joe's blue eyes turned a little watery. He rubbed first one and then the other, in a most uncongenial and uncomfortable manner, with the round knob at the top of the poker. It were lonesome then, said Joe, living here all alone, and I got acquainted with your sister. Now, Pip, Joe looked firmly at me as if he knew I was not going to agree with him. Your sister is a fine figure of a woman. I couldn't help looking at the fire in an obvious state of doubt. Whatever family opinions or whatever the world's opinions on that subject may be, Pip, your sister is... Joe tapped the top bar with the poker after every word. A fine figure of a woman. I could think of nothing better to say then. I'm glad you think so, Joe. So am I.
replied Joe, catching me up. I'm glad you think so, Pip. A little redness or a, a little matter of bone here and there? Where? What does it signify to me? I sagaciously observed that if it didn't signify to him, to whom did it signify? Certainly, assented Joe. That's it. You're right, old chap. When I got acquainted with your sister, it were the talk how she was bringing you up by hand. Very kind of her too, all the folks said, and I said along with all the folks. As to you, Joe pursued with a countenance expressive of seeing something very nasty indeed. If you could have been aware of how small and flabby and mean you was, dear me, you'd have formed a most contemptible opinion of yourself. Not exactly relishing this, I said, never mind me, Joe. But I did mind you, Pip, he returned with tender simplicity. When I offered to your sister to keep company and to be asked in church at such times as she was a willin and ready to come to the forge, I said to her, I said, and bring the poor little child. God bless the little child. I said to your sister, there's room for him at the forge. I broke out in crying and begging pardon and hugged Joe round the neck and dropped the poker to hug me and said, Oh, Joe said, ever the best of friends ain't as Pip. Don't cry, old chap. Don't cry. When this little interruption was over, Joe resumed. Well, you see, Pip, and here we are. That's about where it lights. Here we are. Now, when you take me in hand in my learning, Pip, and I tell you before, I'm awful dull, most awful dull. Mrs. Joe mustn't see too much of what we're up to. It mustn't be done, as I say, on, on the sly. And why not on the sly? Well, I tell you, I'll tell you. He had taken the poker again, without which I doubt if he could have proceeded in his demonstration. Your sister is given to government. Given to government, Joe? I was startled, for I had somehow the idea and I'm afraid I must add the hope that Joe had divorced her in a favour of the Lords of the Admiralty or Treasury. Given to government, said Joe. Boy, wish I say, mean, that the, the main state of you, the main government of you and myself. Oh, and she ain't above partial to be having scholars on the premises. She don't like that. Joe continued, and in particular, she would not be over partial to me by being a scholar, for I fear that she might think I might rise like a rebel if I were a scholar. Don't you see? I was going to retort with an inquiry, but he, but then he'd got as far as why when Joe stopped me. Stay a bit. I know what you are going to say, Pip. Stay a bit. I don't deny you, your sister, comes the mobile over us now and again. I don't deny that she do throw us back falls and that she do droop down us upon us heavy that such times as when your sister is on the rampage, Pip. Joe sank his voice to a whisper and glanced at the door. Candor compels for to admit that she's a buster. Joe pronounced this word as if it began with at least 12 capital B's. Why don't I rise? That were your observation when I broke off, Pip? Yes, it was, Pip. Uh, Joe. Well, said Joe, passing the poker into his left hand that he might feel his whisker, and I had no hope of him whenever he took to that placid occupation. <laughs>
Your sister's a master mind, a master mind. What's that? I asked in some hope of bringing him to a stand. But Joe was readier with his definition than I expected and completely stopped by my arguing circularly and answering with a fixed look. Ha! And I ain't a mastermind, Joe resumed when he had unfixed his look and got back to his whisker. And at last, of all, Pip, and this I want to say very serious to you, old chap, I see so much in my own mother of a woman drudging and slaving and breaking her heart and never getting no peace in her mortal days that I am afeard of going wrong in the way of not doing what's right by a woman. And I'd fur rather of us two go wrong t'other way than be a little inconvenience myself. I wish it was to only me that got put out, Pip. I wish there wasn't no tickler for you, old chap. I wish I could take it all on myself. But this is the up and down and straight of it, Pip. I, I hope you'll overcome, overlook shortcomings. Young as I was, I believe that I dated a new admiration, Joe, from that night. We were equals afterwards, as we had been before. But afterwards, at the quiet times when I sat looking at Joe and thinking about him, I had a new sensation of feeling conscious that I was looking, looking up to Joe in my heart. However, said Joe, rising to replenish the fire, Here's a Dutch clock working himself into being equal to strike eight of them, and he she's not come home yet. I do hope Uncle Uncle Pumblechooks may or may have set foot on a piece of ice and gone down. Mrs. Joe made occasional trips with Uncle Pumblechook on market days to assist him in buying such household stuffs and get goods as required a woman's judgment. Uncle Pumblechook being a bachelor and reposing no confidences in his domestic service. This was market day and Mrs. Joe was out on one of these expeditions. Joe made the fire and swept the hearth and then we went to the door to listen for the chaise cart. It was a dry cold night and the wind blew keenly and the frost was white and hard. A man would die out tonight lying out in the marshes, I thought. And then I looked at the stars and considered how awful it would be for a man to turn his face up to them as he froze to death and see no more hope or pity in them in all their glittering multitude. Here comes the mayor, said Joe, ringing like a peal of bells. The sound of her iron shoes upon the hard road was quite musical as she came along at a much brisker trot than usual. We got a chair out, ready for Mrs. Joe's alighting, and stirred up the fire that she might see a bright glow in the window, and took a final survey of the kitchen that nothing might be out of its place. When we had completed these preparations, they drove up, wrapped to the eyes. Mrs. Joe soon landed, and Uncle Pumblechook soon down to covering the mare with a cloth, and we were soon all in the kitchen, carrying so much cold air in us that it seemed to dry out all the heat of the fire. Now, said Mrs. Joe, unwrapping herself with haste and excitement and throwing her bonnet back on her shoulders where it hung by strings. If this boy ain't grateful tonight, he'll never be. I looked as grateful as any boy possibly could be, who was wholly uninformed as to why he ought to assume that expression. It is only to be hoped, said my, my sister, that he won't be pompeyed. But I had my fears. She ain't in that line, ma'am, said Mr. Pumblechook. She knows better. She? I looked at Joe, making the motion with my lips and eyebrows. She? Joe looked at me, making the motion with his lips and eyebrows. She? My sister catching him in the act, he drew back his back his hand across his nose with his usual conciliatory air on such occasions and looked at her. Well, said my sister in her snappish way, what are you staring at? Is the house fire? <laughs>
would which some individual, Joe politely hinted, mentioned she. And she is a she, I suppose, said my sister, unless you call Miss Havisham a he, and I doubt if even you go as far as that. But Miss Havisham, uptown, said Joe. Is there any other Miss Havisham? Or one downtown, perhaps, returned my sister. She wants a boy to go and play there, and of course he's going. And if he, he'd better play there, said my sister, shaking her head at me, as an encouragement to be extremely light and sportive. If he don't, I'll work him. I had heard of Miss Havisham uptown. Everybody for miles around had heard of Miss Havisham uptown. As an immensely rich and grim lady, who lived in a large and dismal house barricaded against robbers, and who lived a life of seclusion. Well, to be sure, said Joe, astounded. I wonder how she can't the mo no pip. Noddle, cried my sister. Who said she knew him? Which some individual, Joe again politely hinted, mentioned that she might want him to go and play there. And couldn't she ask Uncle Pumblechook if he knew of a boy to go and play there? Isn't it just barely possible that Uncle Pumblechook may be a tenant of hers, that she, he may sometimes, we won't say quarterly or half yearly, for that would be requiring too much of you, but sometimes go there to pay his rent? And couldn't she then ask Uncle Pumblechook if he knew of, of a boy to go and play there? And couldn't Uncle Pumblechook, being always a considerate and thoughtful man, though you may not think of it, Joseph, in the tone of deepest reproach, as if he were the most callous of nephews, though you may not think it, then mention this boy, stand and prance and hear, which I solemnly declare I was not doing, that I have been forever a willing slave to. Good again, cried Uncle Pumblechook. Well put, prettily pointed, good again. Now, Joseph, you know the case. No, Joseph, said my sister, still in a reproachful manner, while Bert, Joe apologetically drew the back of his hand across his nose. You do not yet, though you may not think it, know the case. You may consider that you do, but you do not, Joseph, for you do not know that Uncle Pumblechook, being sensible that for anything we can tell, this boy's fortune may be made by his going to Miss Havisham's, has offered to take him into town tonight in his own chaise cart and to keep him tonight and take him with his own hands to Miss Havisham's tomorrow morning. And Lord, come I see me, cried my sister, casting off her bonnet in desperate desperation. Here I stand talking to me moon calves with Uncle Pumblechook waiting and the mare catching cold at the door and the boy grimed with crock and dirt from the hair to his head to the sole of his foot. With that she pounced upon me like an eagle on a lamb and my face was squeezed into wooden bowls in sinks and my head was put under taps of water butts and I was soaked and kneaded and toweled and thumped and harrowed and rasped until I really was quite beside myself. I may here remark that I suppose myself to be better acquainted than any living authority with the rigid effect of a wedding ring passing unsympathetically over the human countenance. When my ablutions were completed, I was put into clean linen of the stiffest character like a young penitent into sackcloth and was trussed up in my tightest and fearfullest suit. I was then delivered over to Mr. Pumblechook who formerly received me as if he were a sheriff, and who let off upon me a speech that I knew he would begin by ending, by be forever grateful to all friends, especially unto them which brought you up by hand. Goodbye, Joe. Good boy, Pip. Good boy, bless you, old chap. God bless you. I had never parted from him before, 
and what with my feelings and what with the soap suds. I could at first see no stars from the chaise cart, but they twinkled one by one, without throwing any light on the questions to why on earth I was going to play at Miss Havisham's, and what on earth I was expected to play at. Chapter 8 Mr. Pumblechook's premises in the high street of the market town were of a peppercornery and farinaceous character, as the premises of a corn chandler and seedsman should be. It appeared to me that he must be a very happy man indeed to have so many little drawers in his shop, and I wondered when I peeped into one on the lower tier and saw the tied up there brown paper packages inside whether the flower seeds and bulbs ever wanted a fine day to break out of those jails and bloom. It was in the early morning after my arrival that I entertained this speculation. On the previous night, I had been sent straight to bed in an attic with a sloping roof, which was so low in the corner where the bedstead was that I calculated the tiles as being within a foot of my eyebrows. In the same early morning, I discovered in a singular a singular affinity between seeds and corduroys. Mr. Pumblechook wore corduroys and so did his shopman, and so somehow there was a general air and flavour about corduroys so much in the nature of seeds, and a general air and flavour about seeds so much as in the nature of corduroys that I hardly knew which was which. The same opportunity served me for noticing that Mr. Pumblechook appeared to conduct his business by looking across the street at the saddler, who appeared to transact his business by keeping his eye on the coachmaker, who appeared to get on in life by putting his hands in his pockets and contemplating the baker, who in his turn folded his arms and stared at the grocer, who stood at his door and yawned at the chemist. The watchmaker, always poring over a little desk with a magnifying glass at his eye and always inspected by a group of mock smock frocks poring over him through the glass window of his shop. Only he seemed to be the only person in the high street whose trade engaged his attention. Mr. Pumblechook and I breakfasted at eight o'clock in the parlour behind the shop when the shopman took his mug of tea and hunch of bread and butter on a sack of peas in the front premises. I considered Mr. Pumblechook wretched premise, uh, company, because besides being possessed by my sister's idea of a mortifying and penitential character ought to be imparted to my diet, besides giving me as much crumb and as much possible in combination with as little butter as possible and putting such a quantity of warm milk of warm water into my milk that it would have been more candid to have left the milk out altogether his conversation consisted of nothing but arithmetic on my politely bidding him good morning he said pompously seven times nine boy and how should i be able to answer dodged in that way in a strange place on an empty stomach I was hungry, but before I'd swallowed a morsel, he began running a sum at last all through the breakfast. Seven, and four, and eight, and six, and two, and ten, and so on, and so on. And after each figure was disposed of, it was as much as I could do, get a bite, to get a bite or a sup before the next one came, while he sat at his ease, guessing nothing and eating bacon in, and hot roll, and if I may be allowed the expression, in a gorging and gormandizing manner. For such reasons, I was very glad when ten o'clock came and we started for Miss Havisham's. Though it was not at all at my ease regarding the manner in which I should equip myself under the lady's roof that I felt. Within a quarter of an hour, we came to Miss Havisham's house which was old was of old brick and dismal, had a great had a great many bars and iron shutters to it. Some of the windows had been walled up. Of those that remained, all the lower ones were rustily barred. There was a courtyard in front, and that was barred also. So we had to wait after ringing the bell until someone should come and open it. <laughs> 
While we waited at the gate, I peeped in. Even then, Mr. Pumblechook said, And fourteen! But I pretended not to hear him. And I saw that at the side of the house there was a large brewery. No brewing was going on in it, and none seemed to have gone in for a long time. A window was raised, and a clear voice demanded, What name? To which my conductor replied, Pumblechook! The voice returned, Quite right! And the window was shut again, and a young lady came across the courtyard with keys in her hand. This, said Mr. Pumblechook, is Pip. This is Pip, is it? returned the young lady, who was very pretty and seemed very proud. Come in, Pip. Mr. Pumblechook was coming in also when she stopped him with the gate. Did you wish to see Miss Havisham? She said. If uh, Miss Havisham wished to see me, returned Mr. Pumblechook, discomfited. Ah, said the girl. But you see, she don't. She said it so finally and in such an undiscussable manner that Mr. Pumblechook, though in a condition of ruffled dignity, did not protest. But he eyed me severely as if I had done something to him and departed me with departed with the word reproachfully delivered. Boy, let your behaviour here be a credit unto them which brought you up by hand. I was not free from the apprehension that he would come back to propound through the gate. And sixteen! But he didn't. My young conductress locked the gate, and we went across the courtyard. It was paved and clean, but grass was growing in every crevice. The brewery buildings had but a, a lane of communication with it, and the wooden gates of that lane stood open, and all the brewery beyond stood open, away to the high enclosing wall, and all was empty and disused. The cold wind seemed to blow colder there than outside the gate, and it made a shrill noise, howling in and out at the open sides of the brewery, like the noise of the wind in the rigging of a ship at sea. She saw me looking at it, and she said, You could drink without hurt all the strong beer that's brewed in there, boy. I should think I could, miss, said I, in a shy way. Better not to brew a beer, better not to brew a beer there now, or it would turn out sour, boy, don't you think? It looks like it, miss. Not that anyone means to try, she said, for that's all done with and the place will stand as idle as it is until it falls. As to strong beer, there's enough of it in the cellars already to drown the manor house. Is, is that the name of this house, miss? One of its names, boy. Has it more than one name, miss? One more. Its other house, its other name is Satis, which is Greek or Latin or Hebrew or all three or all one to me, for enough. Enough house, said I. That's a curious name, miss. Yes, she replied. But it meant more than it said. It meant when it was given that whoever had this house could want nothing else. They must have been easily satisfied in those days, I should think. But don't loiter, boy. Though she called me boy so often and with a carelessness that was far from complimentary, she was about of my own age. She seemed much older than I, of course, being a girl and beautiful and half and self-possessed. And she was as scornful of me as if she'd been one and twenty and a queen. We went into the house by a side door. The great front entrance had two chains across it outside. And the first thing I noticed was that the passages were all dark and that she had left a candle burning there. 
She took it up and we went through more passages and up a staircase, and still it was all dark and only the candle lighted us. At last we came to the, the door of a room and she said, Go in. I answered, more in shyness than in politeness. After you, miss. To this she returned, Don't be ridiculous, boy, I'm not going in. And scornfully walked away, and what was worse, took the candle with her. This was very uncomfortable, and I was half afraid. However, doing the only thing that could be done, I knocked on the door. I knocked and was told from within to enter. I entered, therefore, and found myself in a pretty large room, well lit with candles. No glimpse of daylight was to be seen. It was a dressing room, as I supposed from the furniture, though much of it was of old forms and uses quite unknown to me. But prominent in it was a draped table with a gilded looking glass, and that I made out at first sight it was a, a fine lady's dressing table. Whether I should have made out this object so soon if there had been no fine lady sitting at it, I cannot say. In an armchair with a, an elbow resting on the table and her head leaning on that hand sat the strangest lady I had ever seen or ever shall see.